southern hemisphere of our world, there is a vast country. Half a continent in size, it is a land of heavenly beaches, steamy rainforests, and vast plains that now feed hundreds of millions. A country with a troubled past, built on slavery and exploitation of resources. 500 years later, it now stands on the brink of becoming a global power in its own right. This is the country of the carnival and the rhythms that spread across the world. This is the country that took an English game and turned it into an art and in the process came out on top. This is where Africa, Europe and the Americas collided and the result was Brazil. Brazil is a large country that makes up the eastern half of South America and is the home of over 200 million people. The name of the country is believed to have come from the Brazilwood tree that once grew in large numbers along the coast, so named by the Portuguese colonists that referred to the valuable red dye it produced. Brasa is ember in Portuguese, so Brazil is red like an ember. Brazil's history, as we would know it, begins with the Portuguese colonization in the 1500s. But prior to this, the vast region of eastern South America was home to hundreds of indigenous tribes that had been living there as early as 11,000 years ago. The largest of these groups were the Tupis, Guaranis, Geish, and Arawaks. As many as 6 million occupied the area at the time of the arrival of the Europeans, but this number was decimated in the following few years, as it was in so many parts of the Americas at this time, by imported diseases that they had no immunity to. In 1494, just two years after Columbus's discovery of the New World, Spain and Portugal agreed to divide these new lands between them in the Treaty of Tordesillas. Because of the poor knowledge of the geography of the Americas at this time, the actual demarcation line was specified as the number of leagues east of the Cape Verde Islands near Africa. And as longitudinal navigation was also poor, the demarcation line varied according to opinion, but was close to the estuary of the Amazon River. All to the west of this line was claimed by Spain and all to the east by Portugal, although the line was not strictly enforced as is evident by today's borders. This treaty is the origin of why today the western half of South America speaks Spanish and why the eastern half encapsulated in a single country of Brazil Good afternoon, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session. And today we are going to look at the South American country of Brazil. And Brazil is a very beautiful country. And as we just learned from the brief video that I just showed you, Brazil does not speak Spanish. They speak Portuguese, okay? A gente fala português. Eu gosto muito a língua portuguesa. E eu sinto muita saudade de Brasil, do Brasil. Não de Brasil, pero do Brasil. Eu sinto muita saudade do Brasil. Eu quero voltar para o Brasil. Now, I miss Brazil a lot. Eu sinto muita, muita saudade means that um, I miss Brazil a lot. Muita saudade do Brasil. And I would like to return to Brazil. Eu, eu quero voltar para o Brasil. I like it. I love it. I enjoyed my two visits to Brazil. It's almost like a paradise when you go to Brazil. Now, my experience in Brazil, the two visits I made were very interesting and, you know, for educational purposes. I was learning Portuguese and I thought that the Brazilian Portuguese was perhaps the best or the better of, you know, it's to, to me, it sounds much better and sounds like a different language to the continental Portuguese, right? In in Portugal, the Portuguese spoken in Portugal is Portuguese, obviously, but it sounds like Spanish. So when they say, for example, cidade in Portuguese, in Brazil, they say cidade, <laughs> right? Cidade, cidade, right? And it sounds more passionate to me and it sounds 
quite musical and I love music. So when I'm hearing the Brazilians speak, it's almost like they're singing and their music, their ability, their gift to sing is something that is incredible. If you listen to Brazilians sing, it is almost like, wow. And they do it so naturally, so effortlessly, something that I've always admired about Brazil. Not to mention their food, a comida brasileira e boa. A comida brasileira e boa, right? The Brazilian food is very good, right? Very delicious, delectable, and it is something that you would definitely like to taste and to, you know, to try, right? Um, because it's a mixture of different foods coming from all over the world. Indigenous food, you have African food, you have Japanese food, Chinese food, you know, European food, German, Italian, right? Just a mixed. And I remember when I went to Sao Paulo and, you know, I went to a restaurant that was like a buffet restaurant and they had all these types of food merged together. And I'm like, wow, it was really a wonderful time I had in that restaurant. But today we are going to look at Brazil in a different light. A lot of times when we talk about Brazil, people tend to talk about racial democracy, particularly the Brazilians. They like to speak about there is no racism. No, now há racismo no Brasil. Hmm? Now há racismo no Brasil. They always say that there is no racism in Brazil. Now existe, right? There doesn't exist any form of racism in Brazil. But is that true? Is there a racial democracy in Brazil? Or is there structural, rabid racism in Brazil? I believe that racism exists in all of the Americas because of the history of slavery, right? We can't fool ourselves that slavery did not happen. It happened. And do you know that Brazil was the last um, slave colony, as it were, to abolish slavery? Right, the last colony in the Americas to abolish slavery, um, I think second only to Cuba. I think Cuba abolished slavery in 1886 and Brazil in 1888. And these colonies, the, 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 the Puerto Rico, uh, Cuba, and of, of, of course, uh, Brazil were all Catholic based countries. The Catholic controlled them and still does to some extent. Um, yeah, Puerto Rico, and we have Cuba, and well, Cuba became a communist nation, but it's still largely Catholic too, right? Because one of the things that is really ironic about these communist nations, particularly those, you know, they tended to have been Catholic and you don't know if the church, they said the, 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 the communist was not pro-Catholic or pro-religion, but there is still um, some amount, a great amount, a great influence of the Catholic Church in these countries. However, let's look at some fun facts about Brazil. Some fun fact information on Brazil so that we can learn about the South American country. Now, around 60% of the Amazon rainforest is in Brazil. That's a lot. And there are more than 400 airports in Brazil. It's a massive country. The Brazilian football team have won the World Cup a record five times. Brazil has one of the largest economies in the world, right? The largest in the Americas, I believe, the largest definitely in Latin America. Brazil shares a border with every South American country, with the exception of Ecuador and Chile. Now, it can't be the largest economy in the Americas because, of course, America would be the largest in the Americas. Um, I beg your pardon, right? But it's the largest definitely in South, Amer in South America and also in Latin America. Brazil is the fifth largest country in the world, both on population and area. The fifth largest country in the world, both on population and land mass area. Right, So these are things that you need to know. The largest population of Catholics can be found in Brazil. Right, but The largest population of Catholics can be found in Brazil. Do you know also that voting is compulsory in Brazil? Yes, voting in Brazil is compulsory. You have to vote according to their laws. Brazil is also home to the largest population of Japanese people outside Japan. 
And when you go there, you're going to see a lot of Japanese people, particularly in Rio and also in um, Sao Paulo. Right? You see a lot of Brazilian uh, Japanese and you think that they're Japanese, but you're going to hear them falando português, right? They're going to be speaking Portuguese, Portuguese, the, the native language of Brazil, which I really, really love. And I love to hear Brazilians uh, speaking their native tongue. Right, something great to listen to. Cidade, um, boa tarde, como, como vai, tudo bem, você, é para você. Right, it's very nice to hear them as they speak their native tongue. Now, this is also very interesting. Brazil was the first country to accept women in their armed forces. So that was something that is also interesting. And Brazil's national drink is known as caipirinha and is also delicious. There's another name for it, is caipirinha, and the Brazilians can tell me if that is correct. There's another name, there's another drink that you have that I'm not remembering now. It's almost like a soda that is very typical, a very typical drink in Brazil, right? A very typical drink in Brazil. And I think Brazil is the largest exporter of coffee in the world, right? You could also correct me on that. But, you know, those are basic facts on Brazil. But let's go and talk about the whole question of race in Brazil. When I went to Brazil, I was flabbergasted to see so many different ethnic groups and what we call races there. It's almost like it's America, right? It's really a diverse country. You know, you have Africans and you have indigenous people and you have a lot of indigenous people in Brazil. You also have, as, as I told you, Japanese, right? Chinese. Uh, you have also Italians and Germans, you know, Portuguese, obviously, because they were the ones who, um, to have colonized that South American country, right? So that is something that is interesting to see the racial um, mixture and mixing, right, that I saw in Brazil. They tend to talk about the miscegenization of the races, that the mixing, the mixture of the races that came together to have created this authentic Brazilian identity and, and authentic Brazilian appearance, as it were. And they are beautiful people, perhaps because of that racial, all of that racial mixing. I remember going to an island, a particular island in Salvador, right? Bahia do Salvador, when I went there years ago. And uh, I, somebody introduced me to this island and I went there for a night. I'm not sure why this is, no, that's, yeah. right. I went there for a night. So I spent a night in that sort of island, on that island particularly. And I can't remember the name of the island, but when I looked at the people and I saw the different ethnic groups, not sure what is reflecting here on my screen. And I saw the different, um, you know, looks there, um, appearances, physical appearances, I was, some of which I had never seen in my life. And I wondered, wow, this country is really a diverse country, right? Brazil, right? Brazil, muita diversidade, right? A lot of diversity is in Brazil, right? For those of you who don't know, Brazil, well, in, in, in Portuguese, the L, when you have L being the final letter in a particular word, like you have Brazil, they pronounce it as O. So it's a Brazil, Brazil, right? O Brazil, right? So they tend and they're passionate about their country, right? And they want to, to ensure that you pronounce their country correctly, right? And I was always being corrected in my pronunciation of O Brasil, right? O Brasil, um país muito lindo. Muito lindo. Huh? And that is something that I like. But let's look at the racial breakdown of Brazil, right? So we have Blacks there, obviously, right? Because the African slaves were sent there um, to work on the Brazilian plantations. And they have been there for all these years. Brazil is also known to be, to have, to contain as it were, the greatest number of Blacks outside Africa, right? So they have the greatest number of Black people outside of Africa. That is something that you need to really digest, right? That this is a country that has the highest numbers of Blacks outside of 
Africa, right? Now you also have the white race Europeans, of course, evidently the island, the, not the island, the country was colonized by the Portuguese, right? So you definitely have, you know, a uh, lot of Portuguese uh, or Portuguese descendants there. You also have Germans, you also have a lot of Italians. What happened after slavery was ended in Brazil in 1888, the country, in the eyes of the Portuguese, was too black, right? There were lots of black people in Brazil. So, you know, what the Portuguese decided to do, the Portuguese, you know, oligarchy, they decided that they would, you know, import, as it were, lots of Europeans to widen, embrancar, um, to widen Brazil, right? To make it become lighter, as it were. And that's what they did. So... They opened up the immigration to a lot of whites, lots of Europeans coming in from Germany, from Italy, um, from other, among other European countries. So when you go to the South, when you go to the Southern, when you go to Southern Brazil, you will see a lot of Italians and Germans, right? And French, you know, it's quite a European, um, you know, community, a large European community living in Southern Brazil. Right, something that you have to understand. Now, a lot of people complain about their racial experience in Brazil. And, you know, recently the Guardian newspaper carried an article, Brazil apologizes after three diplomats, black teenagers searched at gunpoint. So you have, you know, um, these are ambassadors or diplomats and they have their black children in Brazil and they were actually searched at gunpoint. In Brazil, Ministry of Foreign Affairs forced to say sorry to Canada, Gabon, and the Burkina Faso embassies after incident. So we this was published on July 7th. So it's Sunday, it's very, very recent. Brazil's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been forced to apologize to the embassies of Canada, Gambon, or Gambon, and Burkina Faso after three diplomats, teenage children, all of whom are black, were searched at gunpoint by police officers. The incident emerged when the mother of a Brazilian boy in the group protested or posted rather security uh, camera video online prompting outrage, but also a wary recognition that such experiences are all too typical for Black youths in Rio de Janeiro. The three diplomats' children were in Rio for a five-day holiday with a white Brazilian friend celebrating the end of the school year. All attend the same school in Brasilia where they live. It was their first trip without their parents. Late Wednesday, they were returning from a day at the beach and were about to enter a building in the wealthy neighborhood of Ipanema when a military police patrol car drew up. Two officers jumped out, ordered the boys to face the wall and search them at gunpoint. So here you have the children of two diplomats or three diplomats in Brazil who were evidently black, but they were with their white Brazilian friend, right? And whilst they were approaching a very upscale neighborhood in Rio de Janeiro, and it is an upscale neighborhood. I've been there um, in Epanema, very beautiful and attractive place, right? It's very breathtaking, the, um, the scenery there in Rio de Janeiro. And, uh, you know, whilst they were approaching that neighborhood, perhaps the police patrol they decided that they would search these um, young boys at gunpoint. And now they were very, very young teenagers, could be 13 and maybe 14 in that age group, very young teenagers, teenage boys. And they were searched because of their color, because evidently the police did not expect Black people to be living in those neighborhoods. Because largely when you go to Rio, many of the people who unfortunately who are begging on the streets are persons of my hue, right? For the people who you call Black right? Black people are the ones who are the mendicants and the ones who are definitely living in the favelas, right? In the ghetto areas in the mountains of Brazil. For those of you who don't know, the ghettos in Brazil, particularly in Rio, tend to be in the mountains, okay? So they are looking down at the city and they come down uh, at times, and sometimes it can be very dangerous. It can be a very dangerous experience. I remember walking along the 
beachfront area in Rio de Janeiro about seven o'clock, maybe it was about 7 p.m. in the evening. And, you know, you had these, you know, young children following me, it could be, you know, teenage boys too. And it seems to me that they were trying to attack me. You know, they, 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 they were actually um, pursuing me for money, asking me for dinero. Right in Brazil, you have dinero. Você tem dinero, right? And they were asking, saying that I think for me, would tell you for me, which means that I'm hungry. So evidently, it's almost like they were encircling me and trying to, you know, to push, to push, to push me in, right? To pull me in rather. And but I sensed that something was off, and I decided to turn the other way. And luckily, I um left unscathed right i escaped unscathed but you do have situations of violence because brazil is also known to be a violent country right because again because it's a massive country and they also have a lot of wealth there but the wealth is not equally distributed right so because of that there is this you know divide disparity um between the rich and the poor Right? is either you're very rich or you're extremely poor, right? That's the situation in Brazil, which, re which reminds me a lot of Jamaica because that is what happens there too, where you just have this great divide, right? Between the poor and the rich. And that was something that was an interesting experience. But here you have officers attacking two, um, three boys because they were black and thank God they had footage, right? And they were able to post what happened. But this seems to be a typical experience in Brazil because you know if you come here on open democracy, there are some people who have left their experiences about Brazil, right? So here we have um, Brazil's legislation offers protections to refugees and migrants that aren't available in many other countries. However, many migrants, particularly those from sub-Saharan Africa, still deal with widespread racism and xenophobia. Racist attacks have claimed the lives of people seeking safety in Brazil, and there have been several tragedies in recent years. In 2022, a young Congolese man called Moise um, Kabagambe was killed at a kiosk in Rio de Janeiro. In 2020, an Angolan man called João Manuel was stabbed in Sao Paulo. These killings have shaken the migrant community in Brazil and many live with the constant fear of harassment and attack. Now listen to some experiences given um, by some people who have lived there. This says you are discriminated against by the people who should protect you, which who are the policemen. You know, they are going to discriminate against you also. I never go out without a document. This is somebody talking um, who have witnessed and experienced racism firsthand in Brazil. You don't know what will happen. You arrive at an institution like the federal police, which you expect to be free of racism and xenophobia, and you are dis discriminated against by those who should protect you. Remember now that policemen are also what? Citizens of the society, right? And they're victims of whatever their, you know, the cultural norms and cultural taboos that, that they have in Brazil, right? So we must understand that even though they are trained and they're supposed to train to protect the populace, particularly the strangers, foreigners, but they are not so much going to do that, right? The police in Brazil can be very, very brutal. They can be very brutal. They know you don't speak the language, but they don't care. They talk to you, and if you don't understand what they say, they start swearing and calling you names. They should use translators rather than humiliating you or saying things like, go back to your country or sit there, and I would, the N-word. If you have something to say, no one will listen to you. This happened to me that such things are said in a federal police station shocks me a lot, right? Um, now we have here the police ignored by report of hate speech. Sometimes you enter the mall or you enter this is another person giving um, his uh, experience in Brazil, another black person. Sometimes you enter the mall and you enter a store and you can tell they think you're not going to buy anything. They think you're going to steal something. 
they stare at you and pull a face. I once tried to report to the police that I was called a monkey, but even the military police told me, hey, you're living here as a favor. So now I just answer, monkey talks to monkey, right? All right, so this, these are some of the experiences, the lived experiences um, in Brazil. Now, this is another person giving his experience, and, he's, and this person's experience was had in Sao Paulo. Racism has become normal. I remember that once I got lost on my way to Bra, a commercial district in Sao Paulo. I went to ask a woman for information, but she just freaked out and ran away. I was like, what happened? I hadn't even finished saying good afternoon, and she was already running away. We live every day like this. This is not normal, but it happens so often that it has become a normal thing for us. All right? Now, this is the last experience I'll give to you. I had to remain silent. Brazil is a country where you see racism everywhere. Imagine what the situation is for Black and foreign woman refugee. I used to work at a school. One day, the school director himself started to discriminate against me. He started calling me a prostitute, a slut. Now, this is she's Black. Five people witnessed it, and one of my Brazilian colleagues called the police. We went to the station, and there they asked, for my documents. I had the protocol document, but the officers didn't know what it was. The whole thing shifted to whether or not I had a document. I had to remain silent, indignant, but quiet, because for them, I had no document. Nothing happened to the director, right? To the school director who called her a slut, right? That was something that was not very good. Definitely not a nice experience. And that is something that perhaps can leave a bitter taste in one's mouth when you go to a lot of Latin American countries, which are largely Catholic, by the way, right? And Brazil is largely Catholic, as we've just suggested. And, you know, by the way, Brazil is the largest Catholic country in the world, followed by Mexico, which is second, and France, which is third, and the United States, which is fourth. Right, the United States, interestingly, can now be considered the fourth largest Catholic nation in the world. Right, something that's very, very interesting. From the largest Protestant nation, it's becoming largely, rapidly becoming the largest, or one of the largest, I should say, Catholic nations in the world. Right, something that we need to think about. But this is the experience of Brazil, right, a country that is so wonderful and has. So many just charming people who are hospitable because Brazilians are known for their hospitality. Um, I cannot say in my two visits to Brazil, and I did not spend a long time. Each time I went, I spent a month and probably a couple of weeks. There about maybe six, the last time I went, I might have spent six weeks, right? So that would be one month and two weeks. The first time I went, I spent exactly a month. So I cannot really say that I have any great experience having lived in Brazil, you know, because, you know, those were vacation moments. Um, I was able to visit the country, to go to different states. You know, I went to many like Recife, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, um, Bahia do Salvador, right? I went to a number of different states to also... Um, I forgot the, the name of this uh, state now, you know, but I went to a number of them. And um, Brazil is known for its also its diversity in landscape, right? It's, it's beautiful and everywhere you go has something different to offer. You're not seeing the same thing, right? The same, um, you know, landscape. You're seeing something much different. You know, the way how Rio de Janeiro looks, you know, Sao Paulo uh, looks differently, right? From uh, Bahia do Salvador, Right? And I really love uh, Bahia do Salvador. Now, one of my first impressions of Salvador when I went there in 2004 was the fact that Salvador is predominantly a Black, what you'd call a Black state. As you land in Salvador, even though it has racial diversity, you have whites there too, you have mulattoes, you have just different types of people. By the way, I think Brazil has over 176 could be more uh, terms for their different racial groups that they refer to people, different identities in Brazil, right? I wouldn't say it's racial because it's ridiculous to have all those names, right? But there are other more 
what should I say now? Common names like branco, which is stands for white, and you have your pardo. I think pardo means multiracial, right? Uh, among others, you have from even to preto, and preto means black, right? And when you're called preto, it's like it's a very terrible word. It's like you're African African, right? And there's no mixture in you. And they use that word also in Santo Domingo when they say preto. Right, they are also using up. Uh, I think they say preto, right? Preto in in Spanish. Um, they're referring to you as someone who has just African features, particularly ha um, Haitians. So they tend to refer to in Dominican Republic Haitians as preto or as anyone that has predominantly dark skin. Right, they tend to look down on these people. Right. Because moreno is the standard word for dark skinned, but if you are dark, dark like myself, then you are going to be called prieto in um in Santo Domingo. Not much used a lot right now, only when they're upset with you and they want to sort of in their own way um put you down and make you feel very bad about your complexion, about your hue. Of course, evidently if you're educated like myself, you're not going to be following these people who are who need to educate themselves and to be properly taught, right? But that situation exists in Brazil where we do have situations of racism. But Brazil keeps saying that it has a racial democracy, a racial democracy. Now, this came here from Agencia, Agencia um, Noticias, right? Agencia Noticias. It says here that in 2022, about 92.1 million persons reported being brown, right? That is interesting because the last time I read the census from Brazil, you know, I think over 60% or maybe over 50, 50, not over 60% of the people said that they were whites, right? That they were branco, right? Branco is the Portuguese word for blanco, which in Spanish means white, right? And that's what, so they always inferred and always integrated that Brazil has a predominantly white populace, but that's not true. I also read in, in, in articles, um, and I think in scholarly works produced by scholarly people, that over 80% of Brazilian so-called whites have black blood, right? So when they think that they are pure whites, and nobody's really pure whites or pure whatever they call themselves, right? We, especially living in the Americas, right? We have some sort of mixtures. Most of us have some sort of mixtures because of years of centuries of living together on the same soil and moving around. Even not on the same soil, we moving, people are migrating from here to there. So we've got that racial mixture in, or you know, that sort of diversity in our DNA. And that is something that we need to accept and we need to embrace and stop talking about white and black and all that nonsense. So let's re recap that. In 2022, about 92.1 million persons reported being brown, which corresponds to 45.3% of the country's population. Since 1991, this total had not exceeded the white population. So it, oh, it's, they're actually saying that still the white population is the predominant one, which amounted to 88.2 million or 4.5% of the Brazilian population. Other 20.6 million persons reported being black, right? So only 20 point. Now, Brazil has a population of over 200 million people. I, can't, I don't I think it could be 207 million people right now at the moment. So if you are saying only 20.6 of the million of the 20, the over 207 million people in Brazil, um, reported being black, it means therefore that that's only 10.2 of the populace of the population, whereas 1.7 reported being indigenous, that's 0 0.8 of the population, and 850.1 thousand Asian, that's 0 0.4 of the population. But I'm not seeing the population of the people who say that they're old. So we have that in 1991, the total population had not exceeded the white population. This total had not, so the total, the, the, the total of the 92.1 million persons had not exceeded the white population. That's what they're saying. Now, in 2010, the black population grew by 42.3%. And this proportion in the total population went from 7.6% to 10.2%. The brown population increased by 
5.8% and its core proportion in the country's population rose from 43.1% to 45.3%, right? So in Brazil, it seems to me that brown, uh, white, and black are the predominant, you know, identities, racial identities there, right? Something that is very, very interesting. And it's almost interesting that most Brazilians, I'm sure, would not want to identify themselves as black. However, we are. We had a very interesting article which was published um, in the Time magazine, and the title of the article was "How Bra How Black Brazilians Are Looking to a Slavery Era Form of Resistance to Fight Racial Injustice Today." Let me share that article with you so we can, you know, share some perspectives of the article that was published in. The Time magazine. Now, this is the title, How Black Brazilians Are Looking to a Slavery Era Form of Resistance to Fight Racial Injustice Today. Now, here we have a, what you call a Black Brazilian. Obviously, you can see that he is also racially mixed. Now, where are we in? Let me close this here, this icon here. So we have here a dozen people are dancing around a bonfire in a yard between two large warehouses in Sao Paulo. It is early November and members of the Kilombaki or Kilombaki, a black community hub in Peru, a poor neighborhood on the city's northern fringes are celebrating. They've raised 50% of the funds they need to buy the space they've occupied for the past decade and avoid eviction by the owner who is selling up. Right. And they always like to sell up so that they can sell you out. Right. And that happens also in North American gentrification. Right. Everywhere is being gentrified as the fire spits embers up to a dark sky and a steady drum beat marks out a rhythm. The group sings, I will build my refuge. I will build my place. I will build my quilombo. And for those of you who do not know, quilombo is the same thing as um, what you call it again now. Uh, I forgot the name in Spanish. But the maroons, right? Um, is camarones not camarones? It's their the, the the word in Spanish has just, you know, left me. But quilombo is a maroon, right? A runaway slave. I kind I don't know why I'm not remembering in Spanish right now. Now the word quilombo derived from languages brought to Brazil by enslaved Africans was the name given to rural communities established by those who escaped slavery in the centuries before Brazil abolished it in 1888, the last country in the Americas to do so. Remember now that Brazil was the last country in the Americas to, um, to abolish slavery. At least 3,500 of those rural quilombos still exist. But today, Colombo is taking on a wider meaning. Young Black Brazilians say they need to form new communities of Black resistance to deal with a society still shaped at every level by the legacy of slavery. Right? And that's something that's very, very interesting. Now, it's, it's it went on to suggest that many of these racial tendencies, you know, have all, you know, it, 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 they have been legacies have come from a legacy of slavery, but we understand that Bolsonaro, who came to the presidency in 2018, he tended to have compounded, you know, aspects of these racial dynamics. Around 56% of Brazilians identify as Black, the largest population of African descent outside of Africa. So 56%, which is interesting because that is interesting now, because before, you know, when I read it, up some years ago, could be 2015 prior to that, you know, Brazilians were still, according to the census, largely whites. So that's good. So that they're identifying with their race. They're beginning now to embrace their racial, you know, identity, as it were. Yet Black people make up just 18% of Congress, 4.7% of executives in Brazil, 500 largest companies and 75% of murder victims and 75% of those killed by the police, right? So even though you have a population of 56% who identify themselves as black, right? But you look at now the contrast here, 18% of them, of black people make up Congress, that's the Brazilian Congress, and 4.7% of executives in Brazil's 500 largest companies. 75% of murder victims and 75% of 
of those killed by the police, right? No, these are some worrying statistics. Now, it's interesting now that these people who are called themselves the Columbus, they're trying now to form communities, predominant communities in which they can meet and they can develop and immerse themselves in their African heritage, right? That is what they're trying to do. But in, in Latin America, it's going to be very difficult to do something like that because black culture in America, in Latin America, right, in all these Latin American countries um, is often suppressed, right? Because that's what the Spanish do. That is what the Portuguese do. That's what the Italians do, right? These predominantly um, Catholic nations tend to be the most racist um, and, ha and, and have the, the most racist legacy of... Uh, you know, of, of, of history. They tend to be the countries that do not permit something that, you know, they do not permit the interaction of racists. Now, they permitted something that is very strange. They permit the interaction in terms of uniting to, 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 to have children because they want the racial mixing. They do not want to have their cultures looking too dark, right? So you, you have that in most Latin countries where even now, you know, people talk about improving the race, para mejorar la raza, right? And in Brazil, they say melhorar a raza, right? To, to, to improve on the race, you need to, you know, to go with a person of a lighter complexion because people who are dark skinned, they are not advanced. And Perhaps they're also responding to the realities of, of society because they're seeing that black people are not in Congress or they're not represented in a high, you know, um, manner, in a significant manner. Very few black people are in the political Congress, right? And also in other, you know, large business um, entities. So they're responding to that. And, you know, when they look at the fact that what they're seeing are mostly European looking people or lighter complected people, they're saying, you know, why should we want to have a black child, right? Because a black child is not going to be progressive because that's what they're seeing. They're responding not only to what is in their head, but what is what they're seeing, what they're witnessing as a part of their reality, being a part of their lived experience, right? Because if you're not seeing lots of black people in ordinary, well, well in positions of power, in influential positions, then you are going to leave with the impression that black people are inferior. And that's what happens throughout the length and breadth of Latin America, whether it's in Mexico or the Dominican Republic, or it is Colombia, right? All of these countries suffer from that particular mental, um, should I say slavery? Right? Because it is a form of mental slavery. Whether it is Black people or it is also people um, of European descent, yes, yeah, that is also mental slavery. You too can suffer from mental slavery because the legacy of slavery continues to grip your mind that you cannot think, right? And you are you are willing to remain in ignorance. So therefore, even though you are, you are your ancestors, like I'm talking to Europeans now and maybe other ethnic groups, your um, forefathers did not participate in slavery, all right, or were not enslaved physically, but your mind is enslaved if you think that because of slavery, Black people are inferior, right? And you won't do anything to educate yourself about prior history and why Black people were actually caught in that situ situation, why they were enmeshed in this system of slavery. You've got to educate yourselves, all right, for you to understand what the whole notion of sl slavery was about. And the fact that these oligarchs, right, the racial oligarchs, these, you know, financial oligarchs, they too do not like people who even of their hue, but they tend to want to protect them because they prefer to, to be near to them than to be close to former enslaved people. But they too are not necessarily desirous. The financial oligarchs are not desirous of, of, of seeing e even members of their own ethnic group progress, right? The only way that 
they allow it to happen is because they don't want a revolution. And now we're wondering if they're if they even care, because I think they have now protected themselves so well that they don't care now if there is even a revolution. They will discriminate against anyone, even members of their own ethnic group and racial group. Right? Something that we have to understand. But this is what Brazil is um is about. Let us look at something here from the same Times um Time magazine. It says here that now black Brazilians are increasingly looking to another aspect of history for lessons on how to deal with a racist country. Of the five million enslaved Africans brought to Brazil, tens of thousands managed to flee plantations. They settled in rural areas, forming communities outside of white society. To describe these new settlements, they they borrowed rather the word Colombo, often loosely translated as war camp from Bantu languages spoken by some communities in sub-Saharan Africa, says Stephanie Santo, a cultural researcher in Salvador, North, Northern Brazil. The word has many meanings, but basically it's a social practice carried out by nomadic warriors. It can refer to both the warriors themselves and the territories where they meet. Now, that's something very interesting and something that we have. So the word Columbus is, uh, you know, really means you know, runaway slaves, right? Those slaves who run away. Brazil is also a mountainous country, so um, I'm sure slaves had the um, ability, right, to flee the plantation. I'm looking up for the word maroon in Spanish because I don't know how I could have forgotten that word in Spanish, right? In Spanish. Um, it begins with C, but I, it's just not coming to mind right now. I don't know why. Um... Uh, wow, I'm not seeing it. It's not Granate. They're saying it's Granate, but it's not Granate. It is, um, it is, let me see here. My thing is acting up here. Um, the right word for maroons, Cimarron, right? It is Cimarrones, right? Cimarrones, right? It says Cimarrones. That is what I was looking for, right? Um, Cimarrones. Um, Sima, those are the what we call the quilombos in Portuguese, right? And and we have the maroons in Spanish, right? I'm not sure why I'm seeing other things here, other meanings. Let me just make sure my cimarron is correct. I think it's correct. That's the word that I normally taught. Um, yes, right. El término para referirse a cualquier no, why do I have this? Yeah, that is what it is. That is what it is, the cimarrones, because it's saying here simplemente cimarrón a todo aquel esclavo rebelde o fugitivo que llevaba una vida de libertad en rincones, right? So yeah, so that the cimarron, right, it's, it, that's what it is, somebody who has fled. So in Spanish, it is cimarrón or los cimarrones, and in English, we call them the maroon community, and in Portuguese, we refer to them as quilombos, right? The maroons are referred in Portuguese to the Columbus. Now, that is not to say here that Brazil is not a wonderful country, because it is a wonderful country. But we have to understand that the historical legacy of racism is still there, is still evident there. And as we learned, that Brazil is the final country, is the last country in the Americas to have abolished slavery in 1888, right? In 1888, just two years after Cuba had done so, right? So it still has a very, very gripping, um, you know, legacy of slavery there. I remember when I landed in Brazil in 2004 in Bahia do Salvador, I was, you know, I was really, really uh, struck when I saw the fact that a lot of people who look like me are still living on the plantation, right? It still looks like a real plantation. Of course, they're not, you know, in shackles, but it was not looking pretty to see the fact that people who look exactly like me are not, as they're suggesting, working in the banks and they're not, you know, being, a lot of them are not college professors. A lot of them are not, were not at the time. I think that after after a while, they, I think it was in 2010 that they started to have racial quotas 
for universities. But prior to that, I'm not sure why this reflection is here on the screen. Prior to that, um, prior to that, there was not any, you did not have lots of black people entering universities in Brazil, right? You would not see lots of Brazilian um, who were black, black Brazilians going to university. So, so Brazil, um, Bahia do Salvador, I would say 80% of the people in Bahia do Salvador look like me, right? They are dark skinned and they're, you know, they're mixed, of course, a lot of them are too mixed, I must say, but they have, you know, the, the my complexion. Now, the fact is, when I decided to go to the university in Bahia do Salvador, where you have 80% of the people being black, when I went there, I, you know, the people, the students were largely, and the professors were largely whites and, you know, and people who were very mixed. Right? I did, I could not, I did not see, I must say at the time, and, you know, I just did a brief walk through the campus, so I cannot say that there were not many. But of course, walking through the campus, you know, you should be able to see 80% of the people there, you know, are my complexion, then I should be able to see some, you know, they should be prominent there at the university, but it wasn't. Right, the large majority were whites, right, and mixed race uh, uh, students on the campus. So that, and I went back. I think I went back in two thousand ten, back to that same university, and I sat in a conference. I want to see what was happening in, and I did see a little bit more um, blacks, and I saw what was um, this black professor with dreads, and he was talking about Marcus Garvey and stuff like that. So yes, I think in Brazil, Blacks can be accepted and will be accepted. I shouldn't say can be, will be accepted if you are educated, if you have, you know, the financial wherewithal, right? Financial wealth, you're going to be accepted into any culture there. You're Brazilian. Because in, in Brazil, people are not referred to as Afro-Brazilians as you talk about African-Americans, right? People are just referred to as Brazilians, right? So whether you're black or you're white or you're Japanese Brazilian, you are Brazilian. Você é brasileiro ou brasileira, right? You, you're not going to be getting all of these, you know, um, what are hyphenated words, whether you are Italian-American or you are, you know, um, African-American or whatever, right? You are just fully Brazilian. So from that perspective, Yes, you will not have any racialized terminology. However, the categorization is evident when you look at the stratification of the society and the fact that the darker your shade, the evident, more evident you will see that you are not progressive. You are going to be at the bottom of the ladder, right? In just about every aspect of society. But you do have uh, a few Black Brazilians who have educated themselves, right? And they have been able to, you know, advance and to be promoted. But those are the exception, right, to the rule. I don't think also when I was in Bahia do Salvador, when I used to watch the news, I don't know if I ever saw a Black Brazilian reading the news. It's always a white Brazilian or, again, a racially mixed Brazilian. And that is why the school director was you know, referred to this young miss, I think she was from Africa, as a prostitute. She was a dark skin who was given, you know, of the experiences I read to you. Excuse me. He referred to her as a prostitute, right? Um, a whore, as it were, because he thinks that that is the place of Black women. And we're talking about the, 20, the 21st century here, right? And I visited Brazil in the 21st century. But I'm happy, it seems that they're making some form of progress. But that's going to take years to accomplish because you're talking about centuries of mental indoctrination that Black people are definitely um, inferior. Now, my experience in Rio de Janeiro, I only had a racial experience. I mean, a bad experience. I was one day at the beach in Copacabana. And Copacabana is just a few strokes away from Ipa Ipanema, right? And so I was there in Copacabana on the beach, a very big beach. And I think it was crowded on this particular day. But there was this um, um, father with his child, right? And they were walking. I think the mother was there too. So I was walking behind them, 
But I think, I don't know if he thought um, that I was pursuing the child or whatever, but he was pushing the child near to him and he was saying something to me. I don't know what he was saying, but it, I got the impression that he was saying that I should move away from his child, right? Um, because the fact of the matter is that I think that at the beach, you have lots of black people, particularly of my shade. They come to the beach and sometimes they do try to attack people. They rob them, right? Because Brazil in that area can be a very violent area, a very violent um, geographic location. So therefore, I think he was trying to protect his child by what he might have deemed me to have been somebody who was a violent person just by being black. <laughs> Right. So that was an interesting sort of experience. I diffused the situation quite well and was able to walk out of it. Now, um, another experience I had, and I hope that my Brazilian friends are not listening to me, but I had this experience. I, you know, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And um, when I went to Brazil, the my hostess, the lady with whom I was staying in Rio de Janeiro, wonderful lady, she was Catholic. And when she inquired of me, you know, what was my faith? And I told her I was Seventh-day Adventist. And then she introduced me to someone who was living, you know, on the lower floor than her, who was also a Seventh-day Adventist. But she was a white Brazilian and she had two children. And, but she had a black Brazilian who was her helper. And there were lots of conflicts between both of them. And I could see the racial dynamics at play. So even within the church and the, the, the helper sometimes would complain to me and she would tell me some of the experiences that she had had with her white Adventist sister, my right? church sister. So that was very interesting. So it exists and we're human beings. I'm not suggesting here that she wasn't a nice person because I found her to be a wonderful person, the white person and the black Brazilian to be wonderful people there. They treated me very well. And I, you know, I really, really um, savored the experience uh, with them. But I understood. And sometimes I would have to try to, you know, tone down and to sort of diffuse that sort of racial uh, tension between both because it was as if, you know, she should be in her place. But one of the things I did do to send the the white Brazilian a very you know important message was that she had invited me for lunch, the white Brazilian, and I, which I of course accepted, and you know had a wonderful lunch with her. But then before I left Brazil, I made sure that I also allowed the black Brazilian the opportunity to invite me to her home, very humble home she was living. Um, in contrast with the sort of middle-class home that the white Brazilian was living in. You know, it wasn't a rich uh, apartment, but it was much, of course, a much better apartment and uh, with much, you know, superior conveniences and facilities to what, you know, I would, the black Brazilian's home was like a shack, you know. But I went there and I wanted to send the white Brazilian message that, you know, you're a person just like the black Brazilian is a person. And I actually gave the Black Brazilian the money to sort of host that sort of family gathering, that sort of Sabbath meal that she was preparing. And boy, I had a wonderful time. Because when we talk about home, you know, it might be a shack, but it was a home. And the heart that was put into the meal, the conversations that we had, the singing, right? And all of that stuff was a wonderful experience, right? And that I will never forget. So Brazil, love you. Eu gosto, eu amo o Brasil com toda a minha coração, o meu coração, com todo o meu coração, right? Not minha, pero com todo o meu coração, o coração. Um, I really love Brazil, right? I can say that it is to me a second home, and I would definitely like to return. Quero voltar para o Brasil para cantar, para falar com a gente, right? So I would like to go to speak to the people and to sing, right? Because they are wonderful singers, right? And they make you feel at home when you are there. So in spite of this, you know, racism and the fact that it is not the racial democracy as they claim to be. But let me see something here. All of us, including in the United States, we have our, our you know, 
taboos, right? And we have our delusional statements of who we are, right? The United States is a democracy, <laughs> right? The United States is a democracy. And, um, and we have all of these things that we say about ourselves, which are not true. And evidently, it's foreigners who have to tell us that, look here, what you say about yourselves, you know, right? It, it, it is not or are not true. So let's not want to whip Brazil. I would encourage all of you to go to Brazil because Brazil has a lot to teach you, a lot to offer you. And if you go there, I can tell you, you will not want to leave, right? You will see, savor every moment that you will spend in that beautiful, gorgeous country called Brazil. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you like and you subscribe. And my Brazilian friends, I hope if anybody's listening from Brazil, that you will comment, right? And you will let me know your reactions to the video. Please remember to like and to comment because as you like the videos and you comment, then the algorithms will share the videos with other people on the platform, right? Remember now it's algorithms that we're dealing with. It's not that the videos are sent out democratically and everyone sees them and decide to click or not click, right? The algorithms are, you know, are the systems that, is, that are designed to, they decide whether the videos are going to be moved forward or not be moved forward, right? Something that is weird, but that's the system. That's the platform that I am dealing with. Thank you so much for joining. Hope to see you in another video. All the best. Ciao. Até logo.